Thanks, Ted. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to the organizers. So, so it's a lovely place. Um, and uh, I'm sorry I missed so many what appear to be fantastic talks. Um, that's my problem. Okay, so what I want to talk about today are harmonic maps and sort of what do some basic techniques with working with them. I'm not going to do uh, exist, existence, uniqueness, and regularity, you know, the sort of three standard topics of a geometric analyst um, or a PDE person. I'm going to try to talk about how one uses harmonic maps in, in geometric applications, how one works with them, what do they look like, questions like this. Um, so I am, just to put the setting, I mean, I, uh, once we had a visitor in my department in harmonic maps, and uh, he, he was going to give a talk on harmonic maps, he asked me what I do, I said harmonic maps, he said existence, uniqueness, or regularity, and I said none of those. And then we looked at each other in silence and realized that we weren't going to talk again. So, um, so, let me, so let me start... So here's my outline. I'm going to talk. I have, I'm going to assume nothing. I'm not going to assume you know about harmonic maps. I'm going to talk about the, some basics of harmonic maps to begin with. Then I will specialize to harmonic maps between surfaces. I'll even change the notation so you don't get confused. Or, um, and then I'll talk about applications of harmonic maps to Teichmuller theory. This will come in three parts. First, just some basics and what the maps look like in the in the setting of surfaces. Then how one applies it to do like local computations in Teichmuller theory, how to get to, for instance, the Vey-Peterson metric that Keith Burns talked about. Um, then some global theory of uh, what happens uh, not in the small but in the very, very large as one leaves all compact sets. And by then I'll be way over time and so I'll never get to a peak at higher dimensions. But the, the plan is um, that what I'm talking about here is the character variety hum pi 1 of a surface into, say, PSL2R uh, mod to this character variety you may have seen mod the action of PSL2R, and the, the modern, and the, the hot topic modern, uh, nowadays is to not focus on PSL2R, but to have some other group here. And my goal is to talk about the trivial case of the Hitchin theory, where uh, we're talking PSL2R. Okay, so the whole, um, the whole discussion is about this very, this like the simplest case of, uh, of a slightly interesting group, and I'm choosing my topics uh, to uh, as exemplars and as introductions to what uh, to topics that folks study um, in the in the so-called Hitchin theory in the Higgs bundle case. So, but I'll, I'm not going to assume any of that. I'm not going to. I think I'm probably more or less done dropping names about fancy things, and I'm just going to stay with very um, uh, uh, concrete objects in some sense. So uh, first I want to talk about harmonic maps. Right, and so the, the talk is in two parts, I understand. I don't just talk until 5 o'clock. I, I actually take a break at some point. Um, so, uh, so I'm not sure how far I'll get in the first hour, but I will figure out where I'm going after that. So harmonic maps. So here's the setting. Um, we're in a Ramanian setting, so I have a manifold with a metric as a domain. I have a manifold, Ramanian manifold with a metric as a range, and I'm interested in looking at a map from one to the other. Okay, everything, so I'm, I'm for the moment, um, in, uh, everything in sight is Ramanian. These two are metrics, and uh, and let's take, just so I don't have to worry about hypotheses, so let's take the curvature of, of this um, metric on the target. Let's take it to be negative. Let's take it to be negative rather than non-positive. That'll provide for some uniformity in the discussion. Given a map, we can measure its so-called energy. So the energy of a map is defined this way, and then I'll write it in two ways maybe. It's a total amount of energy density. The energy density is look at 
the, the, the tangent map, du, take that as a, as a map between tangent spaces, look at the norm of that, square it, uh, and then add it up with respect to the volume on the domain. So du has some sort of norm depending on m and n, and you have to work out how much stretch squared there is and add it up, and then put a one-half in front of that um, so for historical reasons and so that you'll make sure half the time you've forgotten a half. So the, uh, another way of saying this, maybe this is an easier way, is that if I take a orthonormal frame, EI, orthonormal, on mg. So now you've picked a frame on m. It doesn't matter which frame you pick. Pick a unit orthogonal frame on m. And um, for each one of these vectors, ei, let's push it forward by the map. So uh, if I have some frame here in m and I push it forward, you know, I get a pair of vectors over in the target. Each one of them has a length. So let's work out the length of that on n, that's the amount of stretch, square that, now you have stretch squared, and then add it up over the frame. Uh, that gives you some sort of notion of what's called energy density, the sum of the squares of the stretches. Again, integrate that with respect to m and put a half out front. And that's the total energy of the map, which is the integral of the energy at a point. Okay? So that's some measure of how much stretch, on average or so, a map has. Um, and so then a critical point, so now I can look at all maps uh, from, uh, from M to N. I can measure all their energies. And of course, you know, map being mathematicians, we're interested in the least or more specifically, a map u0, which is critical for the energy functional E of u. So in other words, when I, if I look at a family of maps ut through u0, and I measure the energy of all of them, I get a bunch of numbers, depending on t. I take the time derivative of that. And what I want is that at u0, it should be critical. So um, we often talk about harmonic maps as energy minimizers, but the actual definition is that they're, it's, it's a critical point. It need not be a minimizer. It might be some sort of saddle for the energy. Does that make sense? If I've lost you now, you're going to have to be very polite for two hours. Yeah. Repeat. The definition is take a frame on, on M, U1, U2, orthogonal, push it over, so you'll have two vectors, uh, the push forward of E1 and the push forward of E2. Each one has a length, so I measure the length, I square that, I measure the length of both of them, add it up, or all of them, and that's a number associated to this point. Okay? And then I integrate with respect to, so maybe I should put in, I don't know where to put it in, um, P and I integrate with respect to P. Over the domain, over M. Oh, I see what you want me to do, I'm sorry. It's independent of the frame, you know, you know, the, 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 the sum, this is a trace, so, um, so if I act by something orthogonal, it's not going to change it, change the total energy. Okay, so harmonic maps, if I look at a family of maps, then I find the, a critical one, and that's called harmonic. Does that make sense? Okay, okay. so, um, Let's do some examples. Um, I may end up writing too small. Please let me know um, if, if you can't, if what I'm writing is invisible. The, um, so uh, 
So in terms of thinking about simple examples, we can think about a simple domain or a simple range. Right? So let's think about a simple domain. So for maybe, let's take uh, M to be some interval. You know, a, B, and then N is a manifold. Well, in that case, um, then a harmonic map, so in this case, a harmonic map, U, again, from this interval into N, so here I have the interval, and then I have N over here, and it's, I have some path of U of I. And the, a harmonic map is a uh, geodesic. Uh, now, harmonic maps are parametric objects. It, it's, it's not the, the image subset. It's actually the map. So it's a geodesic parameterized uh, proportionally to arc length. So it's moving at constant speed. And so that's an example of a harmonic map, and I think you've met geodesics, sir. Well, uh, yes and no. So this is, uh, so you're pulling me a little bit out of order, but that's okay. It's okay. Okay. Fine thing for do for someone who's course has concluded and there's no way to get even. So the, so the point is that this, this is a variational problem. So, I mean, if I really carried out what I was saying, you know, and I looked at d by dt norm dut squared d volume, right, then when I worked that out, and so this, this is standard like Euler Grange sort of calculus, what you would get would be something about u0 against some version of test function. Okay? It would have to vanish for every test function. So this geodesic, you know, would have to be, as you say, you know, if I had any way of varying it, to, through something else, it would have to be critical. And, but what you learn from this is that a map is harmonic if it satisfies some funny equation equals zero, which I will actually display in a moment. I, I've, it's too early to write down a, a nonlinear system of PDE, you know, because then people will turn off. But um, so this is. When this is parameterized by arc length, along here it will satisfy that PDE. So then it is harmonic on that, even if it is not necessarily energy minimizing for the free boundary problem. Okay? All right, so that's. Okay, Keith. So what the. Um, so what this equation is, so this is the harmonic map, so this is a geodesic equation. So we're used to what this looks like. Um, so maybe let's add in some notation. This is h, and maybe in coordinates, I'll write the target coordinates on, um, on the metric in Greek letters. And back here, well, later on, I'll have just uh, Latin letters. But the, uh, so the point is that what is this geodesic, what's the geodesic equation? In the gamuth coordinate, I look at the gamuth um, coordinate of u, and I, you've probably met this. On h, I have this Christoffel symbol for h. Okay. Um, if you've, well, you've either met them or you haven't. Um, And I get that's the equation for a geodesic, okay, which you may have met in your regular differential geometry classes. Otherwise, you're meeting it now. It's, um, and it, you know, the, the Christoffel symbols have to do with the target metric. 
And you can see features of this equation. What I'm hoping is you've seen it before, and I can point out some features of this equation. Um, and otherwise, it's a gentle introduction to what the general uh, Euler Lagrange equation is. So, what do you see? You see a second derivative uh, in the, the map starting off. And what you see over here are first derivatives of the map, the dot. These are just coordinate names. It's like the second coordinate, the third coordinate, and this is the seventh coordinate. Okay, and this gamma ties them together. That's a two and a three and a seven. Somehow it fuses everything together. But you see the first derivatives of the map uh, multiplied together. So this is the sort of archetypal system that we're studying. We won't get very far into like the analysis of it, but um, I just wanted you to see a harmonic, an equation for harmonic maps to so have some sense as to what we're dealing with. It's, it's a linear second order equation. That's good. It's got a nonlinear term. It's got a square of first derivatives over here. That's mildly bad. Okay. But, but, and with luck, you've seen it before. So that's geodesics. What else do I have to say? Um, and this, and what we notice is that this is simple because it is an ODE. It's an ordinary differential equation, and you can cite the theory of ordinary differential equations in order to know existence, uniqueness in various settings, or to know that, um, that you're in some problematic setting where maybe something won't work. Um, one comment, since this is for students, I remember when I was um, somewhat younger, um, younger either than the people in the back, the, um, and I, I was in a place where they were doing a lot of geometric analysis, and there was an, um, a, 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 a giant of the field of geometric analysis named Jerry Kasdan was there. And people would always come up to Jerry Kasdan and they would, he, they would say, I have this PDE. Is the following true about the PDE? Because he was a famous for knowing PDE, so they would ask, you know, I, I want to prove this theorem. Tell me how to prove this theorem. Here's my PDE. And, you know, the, the, it, 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 those sorts of questions are always very shocking because people just hand you a math problem and expect you to solve it at the moment. And, and Jerry had a standard answer. So this maybe you, if you learn nothing else from me. The standard answer was, I don't know, is it true for ODEs? <laughs> and that would usually end most of the conversations because people hadn't thought about that. So, um, so, you know, it is a useful, so if you're studying PDEs, it is useful to ask yourself when you're studying it, is what I'm doing true for ODEs in the setting? Is true if I simplify? That's why I start with this. Next example. Um, let's simplify the target. So maybe I'll have my domain, I'll have M, it'll just be some domain in RN, and then let's just map to R, or maybe I just have a manifold. Um, well, it could be either one. And so now I have this map U, and in this case, the, uh, we have a function, and the harmonic map equation is the harmonic function equation. Uh, it's Laplace's equation. It's now just Laplace and U equals zero. So the, the, this equation, this, this funny operator we haven't written down, simplifies to be Laplace, just the a second order derivative on the uh, on the map on the function in this case and nothing else so it's a linear second order equation and maybe it's familiar uh, so let me make some remarks about this so when you've studied harmonic functions you've studied harmonic maps to the real numbers uh, so uh, I'm going to pick on him. So Keith has asked, what does tension, what is this equation, tension of u equals zero? And so what this equation is, if I were to write it out in all its glory, it would be the second, very much like the Adesic equation, I'd have two derivatives on the, uh, on the gamma component of the map, 
then I would have some Christoffel term, something having to do with the metric on the target, and then on those two, um, and then I would have first derivatives on the map in each coordinate, and I'll write an I down here to mean that I'm thinking of D by D X I U alpha, a J here, and I better make sure I'm just using a good frame. This is just nonsense to say that just take a good frame, and that's the equation. And so what you see has, so that's the general equation for harmonicity. It's a some Dodd-Winier system. Again, linear second derivatives on the first term, some first derivatives multiplied by each other on the second term, together with something having to do with the metric H on the target. Okay. And so what is um, so what has happened here is that uh, when N is R, when I have just a target which is a real line, and real lines geometrically are flat, right? There's, if anything is flat, the real line is flat. Then, um, then this has to do, so if it's flat, what we're saying is that this target metric is exactly one. Well, what's the metric on the real line? The metric on the real line is just dx squared, put the one there. And all these terms, then anything having to do with derivatives of the metric goes away. And the harmonic map equation simplifies to being harmonic functions. Okay. So this is sort of the two extremes that get married together in a general situation. Yeah? Say it again. Oh, I kind of did. Um, so tau is the Euler-Grange operator for energy. If I, if I cascaded through this way, a hey, not great board technique, but the equalities all sort of work out. I'll end up with something about u0 against every test function has to be zero. So if it, if it integral against every test function is zero, the, the object is zero. And so you move from an integral expression to a pointwise expression by integration by parts, basically. Okay. Yes, you're confused. You have a question. You, 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 you. you. Okay, you're, you sure? Yeah. Yes. We're not. Well, sort of. Give me a moment. Okay. Hey. Right. And so this. So I will point out that. If, if, if it's flat, so this makes the gammas go away. On the other hand, if, if say, the curvature of this metric isn't zero, that means we, um, that some of these gammas are not zero. And that's going to mean that we have the tau, that is harmonic map system, is nonlinear. And that's good it's nonlinear because we get paid to do hard things. Okay? Linear stuff, well, anyway, I'm, not, I'm going to stop there. Okay, um, so the next, so maybe how to think about harmonicity. So uh, why do we care about harmonic maps? I guess there's two reasons. The one is that this feels like a pretty natural functional, and stretch squared. It feels like something worth studying. Let me give you a different answer. Let's pretend we care about the chain rule. Okay? I said calculus was a requirement for this. So. So let's think about composition of functions. I have a map from M to N, and then I'm going to probe, I'm going to try to understand that map by some function on N. Okay. 
And that's a setting. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, maybe I'm interested in the composition, F composed with U. Well, and so now I have a function on M. Someone hands you a function and you're, an a, and you're you know, a geometric analyst, um, one of the things you might do is take its Laplacian. So let me just ask you, if you do the chain rule, I take the Laplacian of F composed with U, this is you know, a very natural differential operator, so it's rotationally invariant, among other things. What do you get? So I'm taking trace of two derivatives of a composition, right? So you've, you've done calculus, two derivative calculus problems before. You know you're going to end up with two derivatives on one of these and one derivative on the second, and in either order. So we have to get something geometric in the end. So if I end up with something, if, I start, if I'm going to end up with two derivatives on f, well, geometrically I have to have the Hessian of f. That's the only natural operator that shows up. I'm going to be taking a trace. So I better take a trace over this, and I better have one derivative of u involved. So I'll trace, not with respect to a, a basis of the tangent space of the target n, but with a funny basis. I'll push forward the basis on m, and I'll take the trace with respect to that. And, and that naturally involves one derivative of u and two derivatives of f. I could also have one derivative of f. The only natural way to have one derivative of f is a gradient. And then I'll be stuck with, then I'm going to have some dot product of that gradient. I have to end up with a number, so it better be a dot product with this vector field. And so I'll have some vector field, which will be a trace and having to do with second derivatives of u. So some operator, tau. And so you can see where this is going, is that if u is harmonic, that operator tau is exactly the Euler-Grange operator for energy. So from the, um, so the, this energy, critical energy condition is very much tied just to the chain rule. If you want to just do chain, if you just want to do a, a Ramanian chain rule, you're going to be naturally led to this Euler-Grange operator. Tau of you. Okay, so now I can either start over, I think, right? Um, so let me give you a couple applications of, of that. Um, that chain rule principle. But the first refers to your question. Um, so what, what's another way of characterizing harmonic? Well, if you look at that, at this chain rule, you know, you have, if tau vanishes, then this whole next term vanishes. And what, if, and we can see that if the Hessian of f is positive definite, if I'm, if, if I'm looking at a good geometric function so that f is convex, convex functions are good probes of geometry. So if I have a convex function, the Hessian will be positive definite. I take a trace of respect to anything of a positive definite function, I'll get something positive. Okay, so in, in the setting of harmonic maps where this term goes away, convex functions pull back to subharmonic functions. And if you have enough convex functions so that this, you have enough convex functions so that when they, you pull back the convex functions, it's always subharmonic. You can only do that if your tau vanishes. Otherwise, your tau would get in the way somehow and you wouldn't pull back positive here to positive there. So that, that leads to a, a nice characterization, I think, of harmonicity that's maybe um, not so much in the PDE direction, but feels more natural um, if you're uh, sort of more geometrically inclined. So, so U is harmonic if and only if um, U pulls back uh, convex L. 
convex functions, I put in some term here so I'll be correct, to subharmonic functions. So that's a relationship between the, so harmonic maps provide a relationship between the function theory on N, or excuse me, like the geometry on N, convex functions, and the function theory on M, subharmonic functions. So that's another characterization of harmonicity which I like. Um, let's do an application of the chain rule. Just So I, I brought up the chain rule at first to sort of show you this um, relationship between function theory, between um, convexity on one side and function theory on that side. It's also, if you ever want to work with harmonic maps, the chain rule is a really useful tool because it allows you to pick a good function here that's geometric and then analyze it by just doing um, some differential equations, go ask a PDE expert what, what, what you found, ask for an estimate, make sure you've checked the ODEs first, and then, um, you know, and you can read off theorems that way. So let me do an application. Um, I promised you I wouldn't do prove uniqueness, but I think I'm going to lie. Uh, let's see. All right, so, so the application is uniqueness of harmonic maps in the setting where the target is negatively curved. And you'll see how to extend this proof. So, so here's, my, here's what I have. I have two maps, two harmonic maps, from mg to nh. I remember I'm going to tell you that the curvature of h is negative. Okay? And they're both going to be harmonic. And they're going to be homotopic. I better have homotopy because I certainly don't want to say that I can't have two different geodesics on a complicated manifold. Like some manifolds have two geodesics, one on this handle, one on that. So I better have some sort of homotopy to, or, so I'm not dis, so, so that I, I'm proving the uniqueness, at least proving the uniqueness of geodesics in a homotopy class. Okay, so that's my setting. And let's prove uniqueness. And so here's how we set it up. If I have, if the curvature, one way of expressing geometrically, and I think Keith probably talked about this, the, the geometrically the negative curvature of a, uh, of a manifold is that the function distance squared on N, maybe I need to lift to the universal cover, take two points and then look at the distance squared between those points, right? say along a path in a homotopy, this is going to be a convex function. Okay? And on flat manifolds, distances in some sense diverge linearly, and on a negatively curve, they, kind of, they, go, they fly apart in a more convex way. Okay? So this convexity property is going to take us from this analytic condition into um, a condition we can use. And so now what I want to look at is I'll take, I'm going to set up my chain rule again. The function I'm going to look at is distance squared. And I'm going to map, I have a pair of maps, U and V, which are homotopic. And I'll look at, let's go to universal covers. Uh, U and V, and I'm thinking that I take a point P, I look at U of P, V of P in the product of the manifolds, and then I look at the distance squared along the pa homotopic path from U of P to V of P, and I measure that. And that's now a function, this composition is now a function back on the domain. I did it in the universal cover, but it's invariant under deck transformations um, if I set things up right. So, so what have we learned? Um, 
So now I'll apply the chain rule, okay? I want to show that U is V. I want to show uniqueness, which I can't have two different maps. So what do, I want to show that the distance between U and V is zero everywhere. So what have I learned? So now I know that the Laplacian of distance squared between U and V is this trace of the Hessian of distance squared. You know, again, with respect to the push forward, I think it's distracting to write that, so I'll just leave it like this. The, the whole point is that distance squared is convex, so we know that the Laplacian of distance squared is greater than zero. In other words, that's the same thing as saying that the distance squared between these is subharmonic. Better add a hypothesis. Let's make M compact. It's often we, you know, we do a proof and then we back, backtrack, change the hypotheses. But if it's subharmonic, well, that's going to say that if, say, M is compact, that will say that distance squared is at some constant identically. But, you know, I was, a, I, I now I remember I said, I was really careful, I said curvature strictly less than zero. So this trace of distance squared, well, is greater than zero, is greater than equal to zero, and in fact it's greater than zero unless, for example, u and v both map to a circle or to a arc, and we and um, the homotopy is a translation. So, except in that setting where I've mapped, where I've taken my big map, my manifold M, I've squashed it down to a circle, and U and V are just rotations. Then I will have strict positivity here, and then that will say, you know, unless um, U and V have rank one, which is a way of saying I've squashed it to a circle, that will say that the distance squared, if it's a constant, the normal positive of a constant is zero, but a zero can't be bigger than zero, so that'll say the distance squared is identically zero. So that's a quick sort of proof of uniqueness. Um, I maybe, you know, I expect I lost several of you on this little passage. It's the sort of thing if you go off and think about it, uh, you study it for a couple minutes in silence, it'll be fine. Mostly I want you to just get this impressionistic idea. We apply the chain rule. The chain rule translates this geometric op information into some analytic op operation, uh, and some function theoretic knowledge, and then we know things about functions on manifolds, and that allows us to tell the answer. Okay. Let's do this example. If M is a surface, and... Yeah. So if M is a surface, N equals R, then again, you know, um, we've said that harmonicity is Laplacian U equals zero, but it's a surface. And since it's a surface, um, let's make it just for the moment a flat surface. Uh, it's not, that's not going to affect much of what I want to say. But I want to, so, you know, we think of Laplacian U, so maybe you're thinking of this as dx squared plus dy squared U, that's fine. But I would want to think about it for the moment as um, d by dz U and then d by dz bar in respect to the natural um, complex coordinates on the surface. Okay, so that's I've just written Laplacian in complex language. But, but here you see something really important, really interesting. So now I'm going to make one more step on this, and I'm going to do something really deep. And I'm going to write d by dz bar d by dz of u as d by dz of u parentheses to d by dz bar of that. 
Maybe I'll write that. That's my final conclusion. The z bar derivative of the z derivative of u is zero. So, but in other words, when I put this in parentheses, what you're supposed to observe is that the z derivative of u, this object, we have now from something harmonic extracted something holomorphic. So somehow tied to harmonicity, our, um, when in the presence of some complex structure, tied to harm harmonicity of a map is, is holomorphic objects. So if I want to get fancy about this, I'll say that I'll, d by dz u, what is that? Well, that's the tangent map du. And if you think about it tensorially, if you know these things, you look at the dz part of that one form, and that one zero part of the tangent map should be uh, have d bar equals zero. That's so. It's, it's a, the, the conclusion is u harmonic, and let me just be um, an Emma surface. Let's say that there is some whole. There is a whole morphic. object related. There is a, sorry, related holomorphic object. And so that's important. And, that, and this is really the first peak, maybe the simplest example of part of the Hitchin theory where um, one studies uh, representations by studying harmonic maps, which I've now lost, and then the associated those harmonic maps, so in, the, so in some sense, well, we associate those harmonic maps, maybe you want to think of harmonic forms, there's some holomorphic object. So there's three types of objects that are related. One is the representation, which is algebraic. Another is a harmonic map, which is somehow, um, Hodge theory, real, real geometry, and then the third thing is something holomorphic. Uh, maybe the words dolbo come or should be used there. Um, and so that's sort of a hint, and we're going to do more with that. Okay, that's Roman numeral one. Okay, only took an hour, so I should be done in four more hours or something. So the, um, it's a joke. So the, now I want to talk about harmonic maps. Between surfaces. So here's my, let me change notation. Um, so I'm going to have a domain surface, M, of a range surface, N, I'll be mapping from one to the other. Uh, on the domain surface, I'll have a metric, which I will write as some number times the Euclidean metric dz squared. So, so with on M, I have some complex coordinate z. And I'm going to express some metric in terms of z. So it's... The Euclidean metric locally is absolute dz squared, that's dx squared plus dy squared, it's your standard metric, multiplied by some number, by some function, that changes it. And then over on n, I'll have some coordinate w, and so I'll express the metrics on n in terms of dw squared, and then I'll have some other function, rho of w, dw squared. And it's... Now, this some, then I'll do something which um, maybe you hate, but it's convenient. What takes me from Z to W? Because W is made, so uh, taking me from Z to its image, W of Z in that coordinate, well, the map W does that. So maybe that bothers you, but if, in terms of charts, it actually makes sense. Um, so I'll take my map W as the map from M with this metric to N with that metric in that coordinate. And if you just, you know, you think about complex 
analysis, you were very much used to having a z-plane and then a map w to the w-plane, and you take one domain to another. Okay, and that's all I'm going to do on a, just on a surface. Okay. Now, now somehow W is comparing M, the domain M to the domain N. That's the, uh, the point of view I'm going to take. This is, I can think of W as a probe. In this case, and when they both have the same dimension, I'm going to think of sort of comparing the two. So this, this surface here is getting mapped on top of that surface there. Maybe there's some folding, maybe there's some branching. I don't know, but I'm somehow comparing them. And if I want to compare them, um, so how to compare uh, M sigma and N rho of W dW squared? Well, I got room. Okay. Well, the, what I'll do is I'll just pull back the metric here, the metric on the target, by the metric on the by the map. So I have a metric here. I'll pull back that metric, and then I'll have two metrics. I'll have the original one, and I'll have the pullback. Forms pull back. Right? So this is a symmetric tensor. It pulls back. And you know, if you want to, on the pullback, measure lengths or angles, what do you do? I have two vectors here. I want to measure their angle with respect to the pullback metric. I take the vectors, I push them forward, and I work them out in the metric here. That's what pullback means. So this isn't, but when I pull it back, so I'm pulling back rho dw squared, and maybe I'll even write that out as rho dw, dw bar, I'm going to do a tiny bit of algebra. Um, it's, it's for effect. You don't so much need to follow it. But I'm going to pull it back, and I'm going to get, and when I pull it back, I'm going to get a bunch of terms. I'll have some terms that have dz, dz bar in them, right? D, what is dw? dw is wz, dz, wz bar, dz bar. What is w bar? Well, that's w bar z, dz, w bar z bar, dz bar. I multiply all that out. I pull it back. I have some terms that are dz times dz. I have some terms that are dz bar times dz bar. I have some mixed terms. I gather them all together, and what I get looks like this. Rho wz wz bar bar dz squared. Um, now I'll be a little bit care I'm gonna be clever. Rho of w sigma of z wz squared, rho of w sigma of z, wz bar squared, that's dz, dz bar. And I'm just writing it so we will look in a minute. Um, and then the same thing on the other side, bar, dz bar squared. This is a real object, so whatever's non-real has a conjugate, shows up to make the whole thing real. Why do I do this? Um, let me, because I want to point something out. Trust me on the algebra. I'm going to call this object phi. I'm going to call this object h. Once I do that, every, this object is phi bar. There's no new information. And this object, if you do the algebra, is phi squared over h. Purely pointwise algebra. Just symbols. And that's what it turns out to be. 
Okay, so the pullback metric depends on only two quantities. One is some sort of quadru some differential, and the other is a function. And if I know those two objects, the whole the differential and the function, then I know the pullback metric. I know the metric. So you can ask, how are Okay, so let me conclude. To know rho is enough to know phi and h. And and now the next in the next five or six minutes, I'm gonna tell you why I picked those two bits in order to, um, uh, to describe the metric. I mean, you know, algebraically, I could, there's lots of two objects I could pick that would completely determine the pullback metric, um, but why those? So the first is that this phi has a name. So notice what we did, we pulled back the metric we, we took the dz squared part, so I write 2, 0, because it's got two dz's and no dz bars. And this is called, classically, the Hopf differential of the map w. And it's a famous object that goes back to the 30s or so, 1930s, before you were in grad school. So the, for I was in grad school. So the, um, so that's why it's important. And, and it is, in this setting, remember we had this comment about how harmonic objects I induce holomorphic objects. This is the holomorphic object to focus on for harmonic maps between surfaces. Because when I take the z-bar derivative of phi, so the z bar derivative of whatever I wrote down there, rho, w, z, w, z bar, bar, whatever that is, what you get when you write everything out is you get some stuff, which I'm not going to write out, and then times, roughly times the tension. That just comes out by when you take the derivative. You see you get... You know, if I take the z-bar in here, I'll have like a, if it hits the wz, I get a Laplacian. If it hits the row, I get one derivative of the metric, I get Christoffel symbols. Product rule says I get a sum. And so it's not inconceivable you get something holomorphic, but it's just algebra, and the point is that that, that object is holomorphic. So that's a good object to focus on in this pullback. And then we just write it out in terms of everything else, and so we, we find this H. And so, you know, so now, how does H relate to phi? So, let me skip some stuff. Using that the curvature is identically minus one, that'll save me a step. There, the relationship between h and phi is that there's an equation that h satisfies that's only in terms of phi. And this equation has a number of names. So, um, so h relates to phi via the following. I take log h, this is slightly different than the um, language that Norbert uh, introduced. I get 2h minus 2 phi squared, this is, norm. This is with respect to the background metric, over h minus 2. So that's an equation. This is called the Bachner equation. 
in the setting of PSL2R, this is the relevant equation for us of the Hitchin equations. Actually, the second Hitchin equation is this z bar phi equals zero. Hitchin equations, there's two Hitchin equations. The second one would be that d bar phi equals zero. And so this is the equation to study. Okay. And you see it only involves, is an equation for h in terms of phi. It's more or less, if you just stare at this part, you know, you'll recognize the, the prescribed the Liouville equation, the prescribed curvature equation. This a part of the equation more or less says that a, a, a metric, which is just h times the Euclidean metric, is hyperbolic. And this incorporates the map. Okay, so this is the equation of study. Okay, now alas, we have to do some, think about some PDE stuff. But I'll say this is a pretty friendly PDE. So let me just make a few remarks. Um, the president of my university is a lawyer. Can we stop the tape for a moment? Anyway, and he has this joke he says a lot in my presence, which is that lawyers are the people who go in, people go into law when they faint at the sight of blood or equations. So they can't be doctors or engineers. So anyway, so I'm a little hesitant to put the equation on the board, lest if you're not in PDEs, you sort of faint at the sight of equations. But um, this is a friendly PDE. What makes it friendly? Um, so I'll just point out the right-hand side. So the right-hand side is 2h minus 5 squared over h. 2h is convex in h, right? Minus something over h is convex in h. So this right-hand side is both convex and monotone in h. That's really good. That's going to really help. So. Um, Another way, which is a similar point of view, is that um, this equation satisfies so-called satisfies a maximum principle. That's, a, that's also a very friendly aspect of a differential equation, um, and one which we will uh, exploit. I'm not open a new one. So, for example, um, let me show you how friendly it is. Let's learn something about H. Okay. So, uh, i.e., what can we learn about H? Well, So now I'm going to refer you to my prerequisite, the second derivative test. Okay. Well, at a minimum of h, what do I know? I know that I'll be at a minimum of log h. And so, at a minimum, the second derivative of log h with respect to x is positive. The second derivative of log h with respect to y is positive. So, the whole Laplacian of log h is positive. But Laplacian of log h is 2h minus 2 phi squared over h minus 2. Right? Um, that's a negative term. So that's, this whole thing is, let's get rid of the negative terms, at least 2h minus 2. 
So at a minimum, so H, that's a minimum point. Well, so at a minimum, let's say the minimum's name is P0. H of P0 is at least one. Bring the two to the other side and divide. So very quickly we have learned, and that's a minimum. So the, the smallest H gets is one. So that means that just as a function, H itself is at least one. And this is what I mean by this equation satisfies a maximum principle. You have to have a bunch of things going right so that you can learn something this useful, it'll be useful, this easily, just by applying the maximum principle. So H is at least one. Um, so let's see, what's, is there any time when H is exactly one. Well, note, note that when rho is sigma, and then this map W, so if I'm mapping a surface to itself, a good guess for the harmonic map between a surface and itself is The identity, right? A good, that feels like a good map. And you can check that the identity is, since it's an isometry, it is harmonic. Okay? It feels like isometry should be harmonic, and indeed they are. So this map W is exactly Z. And what's that going to mean? Uh, I told you I wouldn't force you to do any algebra, but I guess I lied. So phi, remember, is wz, wz bar, so wz bar is zero, because w is z, z bar derivative of z is zero, so this hop differential vanishes identically, and our equation for h is then h satisfies Laplacian log h is 2h minus 2, and note that this means that h identically 1 works. Or if you like, you could just put in w is z, rho is sigma, you'll find h is identically 1. Anyway, you cut it, h is identically 1. So, so what we've learned is that there's one moment when h bot is exactly one. Otherwise, it's maybe bigger than one, and maybe I won't um, check. Okay, so it, it's pretty easy to check, I think, that if h is identically one, then it, it has to be true that rho is sigma, and W is Z. Uh, just put it, H is one makes this zero, makes that zero, so then the phi has to be zero. Do you see what I mean? It, it's, it's algebra to check. All right, um, good. So here's our picture. We now have a picture of Teichmuller space. Or some sort of, ooh, I don't want to do that. I should ask, um, until it's been three weeks, do I, should I define Teichmuller space, or does everyone, yes, define it? Okay. So Teichmuller space is the following. There's a couple ways of saying it. Um, so in here, I'll, let's let S be a surface just a differentiable surface of genus G at least one. So it's, it's, it's a wooden surface. And I'm going to take this wooden surface and I'm going to put various types of clothing on it, various types of metrics. The surface itself is fixed and I put different structures on it. Okay. 
That makes sense? And so the structures I'm going to put on it is I'll think about all hyperbolic, by which I mean curvature identically minus one, metrics on the surface. I'm not done yet with the definition. The problem is I don't want to consider all hyperbolic metrics. There's an infinite dimensional family of hyperbolic metrics. Take one, take a small diffeomorphism, diffeomorphism close to the identity, Moop, push the metric over by that small diffeomorphism. That's a new hyperbolic metric, the, the hyperbolic metric. The push forward or pull back of a hyperbolic metric remains hyperbolic. The, the inverse map is the isometry, right? So I don't want to, I don't want to count those as different. So I do this up to equivalence where, um, uh, G is equivalent to H if and only if there exists some isotopy um, of S to itself, which pulls G back to H. Okay, some diffeomorphism of homotopic to the identity. Okay? So that's type more space. It's a space of different hyperbolic metrics on the surface. Different where I mean... Um, you can't get from one to the other by diffeomorphism homotopic to identity. Okay, and um, so the fact is that the Teichmoor space of a surface of genus G is homeomorphic to a ball of real dimension 6G minus 6. Here it is. Okay, and what we've been talking about is that sitting there somewhere in the middle of this um, hyperbolic, this space of hyperbolic metrics, is some hyperbolic metric I've been calling sigma of ZDZ squared. And I'm imagining that there's a, another hyperbolic metric somewhere else, rho of WDW squared. Okay? And that's our picture. And what we've now learned is that at this point, if I think about some harmonic map W, which takes me from sigma to rho, okay, I hope it's okay to introduce this notation. So here I'm thinking of W sigma to rho as the harmonic map from M sigma of Z dz squared to itself. Oops. M is the same as S, S is the same as M, M rho of W, dW squared, and I'll just call that unique harmonic map. We know it's unique because it's homotop, they're, they're homotopic. Um, they're in the same homotopic class. I'll call that W of sigma rho, and this W of sigma rho comes back here, so what have we learned? Um, for W of sigma rho, there is a hop differential phi of sigma rho. What is that? We'll take your harmonic map W of sigma rho pull back that metric back to the domain, and then look at the two zero part. So this is some quadratic, some holomorphic quadratic differential, sort of dz squared thing. Mm, let's be really fancy. It's a section Does that make people happy or unhappy. Vote. Happy or unhappy? Happy? Unhappy? <laughs> okay, but uh, here we go. So uh, it's, this just says it's, it's a DZ squared thing, and this is saying it's holomorphic. Okay. Sorry? Sections of you know, holomorphic sections of that bundle. We're, we have unhappy people. So... Um, and the point is that now, 
um, on my picture, hey, this thing's blinking at me. We've got four minutes. Um, another way of, so in this picture, which I'll now amend, I have my sigma, I have my rho. Back here, if I look at sigma to itself, that function h is identically 1, and that Hopf differential is identically 0. Over here, the h is not identically 1, and this quadratic differential, and remember the quadratic differential, let's try some other notation, it's some quadratic differential, it's, a, it's in this vector space of differentials back on sigma, okay, but it is not identically zero, it's somehow different. Does that make sense? Anyway, so this is, I'll, I'll say more about this um, over time. But this is sort of our picture of Teichmuller space now. And maybe I'll flesh it out a little bit. And the little bit I want to flesh out is just the definition. So the... From the perspective of Teichmuller space, we have a map. Okay? And the map, which I'll call phi again, maybe not so, now I'll call it phi. It's going to take us from Teichmuller space and, to, and it's going to take us back to these quadratic differentials or what I wrote before this object. This is actually, if you start reading the Hitchin um, papers, is, is things will be, the analogs will be expressed in this sort of language. So it's, um, it's only a little bit of showboating for me to do it this formally. It's actually meant to, um, to, to, be, have to present an analogy. And what am I, how does this work? If I take some metric, some hyperbolic metric in Teichmuller space. What then I want to look at the, this Hopf differential of the harmonic map from sigma to rho. So, in other words, I'll write it again. Look at the harmonic map from sigma to rho. Pull back the metric by that harmonic map. That metric, that pullback metric, breaks up like this. And from the whole big pullback, just pull out this part. Pull out the two zero part. It's a little bit like pulling out, remember when we had d d bar of d z u equals zero, and we pulled out the one zero part of the tangent map. Here we're pulling out the two zero part of the pullback metric as something holomorphic to study. And so, so that's an interesting map. What we know that it does is it takes sigma to the zero. To the, the, wherever you, your base point is, you're going to get zero. So associated to this Teichmuller space, we have this, I'll end with this picture. Um, we have this somehow, here's Teichmuller space, here's sigma. We have some vector space of quadratic differentials on sigma, and somehow, and this vector space has rays, and somehow associated to one of these quadratic differentials is some um, hyperbolic metric rho. And I will, in the next uh, um, session, I think I'm done, yes? Um, in the next session, uh, I'll talk about, um, I'll explore the consequences for Teichmuller space. I'll actually start with 
using the talking about the there's a picture associated to this hop differential and that picture for a quadratic differential um, may be interpreted in terms of a picture for the shape of the harmonic map and we will use those pictures to talk a little bit about um, how one develops sort of a local theory for hyper for tight more space what happens if you vary hyperbolic metrics what happens to the functions on the surface and in a global theory, what happens is you leave all compact sets in Teichmore space, and what happens to the harmonic maps and what happens to the pictures. So coming up next time, we look really close here, and we look really far out. Okay, thanks a lot. Any questions? Could you say that again? I just didn't hear you. I don't hear well. As, you've po as has been pointed out, I'm older than you. So uh, phi is not entirely determined by age, right? Um, I'm sort of thinking of phi as the input. Yeah, but if you want to solve your... PT. Oh! Okay, so this was going to come up next time, but you will notice this is norm squared of phi. Yeah. I think this is what, is this what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. You're pointing out to me that, hey, if I put in an e to the i theta here, yeah, yeah, so. then I don't change h. That's right. So there is some funny circle action here where the phi's change by e to the i theta, but the h's as functions don't change at all. Um, and, you know, the metric changes. This doesn't change, this doesn't change, but these off conform off diagonal parts change. So, um, and that circle action has been uh, exploited a lot by, um, there's a bunch of great papers, two great papers, Bonsante, Mondello, Schlenker, where they, um, they understand that circle action in terms of what they call landslides, a sort of horror cycle action on Tyke Moore space. Did I, have I respond to your question? So, any more questions? <laughs>